Well, if you're new or joining us, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Chris, one of the pastors here. Our mission at the church is to connect with the Lord, our God, one another, and the world around us all through the love of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways we love to do that is partnering with ministries outside of our walls, locally, here in our state, and around the world, for those that God has raised up to be proclaimers and embodiers of the gospel uh, all across the globe. And we are just so privileged to have with us one of those ministries. And to introduce that ministry, I'd like to invite up Chaplain Jim Prose, one of our elders. We will welcome Jim up here, please. So, Jim. I'm one of those guys redeemed, renewed, refilled, refreshed by the power of God. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad. And I have the privilege this morning to stand up here and introduce a ministry that's very close to my heart. I've memorized their phone number, 313-531-0111, because I have sent many men to, to this uh, program of redemption and renewal so that uh, these guys can have freedom, these gals can have freedom. Life Challenge is a, a, a 12-month in-house rehab facility for those that are struggling with stuff, and who isn't anymore these days, it seems. We have supported, Cornerstone has supported this ministry, I bet you, 25 years. Jeff Bonslar is the chief guy. He will come, and we'll hear from him. You'll hear from them today. This, this is a great ministry of restoration, of renewal, of refilling, of refreshing and relaunching. It's it's good. When you throw your money in, part of it goes to support folks like this. We're so grateful to have you. We're so grateful for what God is doing in you and for you. And those guys, can, can you guys give a shout out to the guys here and the gals here? Amen. Amen. of the gospel of Jesus Christ to change lives. Thank you for understanding that every life matters. I've been working in this field all my life. In fact, I grew up at a center, and I got to see firsthand broken people who lost their way. People like you and me, people that could be, you know, a son, a daughter of yours, a brother, a sister, who just found themselves in the clutches of the enemy. And I have seen what Jesus can do in people who are willing to say, I can't do this. I need help. I know the story looks different for everybody. You know, the end goal isn't always what we had imagined. Notwithstanding, I believe what Paul said is true in Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. As Chaplain Jim mentioned, um, we are a long-term facility. You know, we thank God for programs that are short-term. We thank God for programs like AANA and CR, you know, that help people through meetings and times of gathering. But we know, I think we all do, that some people need to get away for a spell, for a season, three months, six months upwards of 12 months. And what we do at our ministry is provide an opportunity for men and women to heal. And that is grounded in the love of God through Jesus Christ. Now, I get around to a lot of different churches and I ask a similar question. I've asked it here before. I'm going to ask it again. How many of you are presently in recovery? Raise your hand. Okay. A few of you. How many of you struggle with pride once in a while? <laughs> Anger? You know, a grumbling spirit? Worry? Anxiety? Some of us like Amazon treats to greet us when we get home after a hard day's work? Come on! You know, not all addictions are, you know, inherently bad, at least the vice itself. It becomes a vice when it becomes an inordinate pleasure. 
I think of myself, by the way, as a recovering legalist. Over 50 years, you know, God loves not only tax collectors and sinners, He loves Pharisees. And I'm one. He loves. And He continues to recover me through the love of Jesus Christ in His mercy. So today, I just want to establish a common ground. There's only two kinds of people in the world, those in recovery and those who need to be in recovery. Or if you prefer, those who are being sanctified and those who need to be sanctified. Are we cool? We good? So I want to invite at this time my son and the choir, and you're going to hear some testimonies through different mediums. You're going to hear our choir sing. Our goal here is to show off. Let me qualify. (laughs) To show off Jesus Christ, his wisdom, his faithfulness, his goodness, his mercy. So would you um, welcome our our crew as you did, and may the Lord be praised. Good morning, church. Hi, so my name is Luke. I'm one of the ministry leaders in Detroit for the campus that's there. And um, just out of curiosity, how many of you guys, just by a show of hands, know somebody in your network or in your social circle who's going through a drug and or alcohol problem? You know, maybe at school or at work, a colleague. Just turn around and look at all the hands. Hold them up. Look Mm -hmm. at all the hands that are raised here this morning. Yeah. And I I asked that question to show you that addiction is not a respecter of person. It doesn't matter where you grew up or how you grew up, what side of the train tracks you were at. It doesn't matter your genetic code or any of those things. It reaches and affects all of us. But at the same time, there is now a network here of ambassadors that can go and tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. And I hope and pray that after this service that you will be equipped with some of our brochures. So please visit our table back in the lobby following service. We would love to equip you so that you can help those in your life that you love. Amen? Well, I want to introduce one of my friends to come to the platform with me. His name is Jake. And like my father had said, we're actually going to be sharing this message of hope, help, and healing um, through a couple different venues, uh, through testimonies, through the choir, and through some spoken word. But let me introduce you to a friend of mine. Um, Why don't you introduce yourself, um, where you're from, and how long you've been here? I'm Jake. Uh, I'm from Warren, Michigan. I also grew up in Sterling Heights. They both border each other over on the east side, and I've been in this program for 11 and a half months. Which is phenomenal, by the way, because you probably heard we are a 12-month program, and so Jake is now around, more than rounding third base. You're about to slide into home plate. Uh, and so, Jake, you know, one thing that I do know about you, you are a competent individual. Um, You held down a job prior to being here. You're smart, you know, when it comes to academics. We have a very rigorous program, and he scores very well in those things. You're a smart guy. And uh, I'm wondering, did you know better when you were coming into this program, what was going on in your life that was spinning itself out of control? Oh, yeah, I knew absolutely what I was doing was a major problem. The only thing was I I didn't care. I grew up in a very broken household. Uh, I grew up with an uh, alcoholic father who was abusive towards me and my brother and my mother. Um, And I grew up just not understanding why I had to live with that, why I had to deal with that, why God would do that to me. So I just had so much hatred and anger throughout my entire life, and I went to the bottle just to numb myself so I could get through that on a daily basis. It was um, very rough, and um, you know, I never thought that what plagued my childhood would ravage my early adulthood. So you experienced this from those that you loved, and you were hurt by that. And did you see yourself becoming that yourself? I mean, you had this hatred towards that individual or towards this situation, and yet you might have found yourself maybe becoming that type of individual that you didn't want to be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I didn't want anything to do with my family or friends. I lived in complete isolation. I hated everyone and everything. I wanted nothing to do with anybody. I hated myself. I hated that I had to wake up in the morning and look at myself in the mirror 
and I just drank to take that pain away, hoping to pass out every night. I didn't want to live anymore. I wanted nothing to do with life, and I wanted nothing to do with God. Did people know what was going on? Yeah, my whole family knew. They would try to reach out to me constantly. My grandpa's been trying to get me in this program for five years ever since I left off to college and I just completely ignored them and shut them away because I wanted nothing to do with it. I didn't want to better myself. I didn't think I deserved a better life. You didn't think that you deserved a different life. Do you hear that? So you're struggling with some things on identity, struggling with some things on value. At what point was there a moment of epiphany? Maybe it was the the ministry of your grandfather after five years of trying to get you into this program. What was that breaking point that finally kind of ushered you in? Well, between 2021 and the time I got here, I was in and out of the hospital about 40 times. Um, I had a doctor that told me I would probably be dead by the time I turned 27. I'm only 24. Um, and I don't know, one day I woke up and I realized if I actually don't get a grasp on this thing, I'm going to die. I, you know, flirted with death the last time I detoxed in the hospital. I had a seizure in the hospital from my withdrawals, and um, that's the moment that I realized this is serious and this is really going to take my life, and then I started worrying about where am I going to go when that happens. Mm. And so your grandfather, who's been praying for you, you're in the hospital. What was that conversation like? Uh, I remember calling my grandpa, um, and I told him, uh, I just apologized for everything that I dragged my family through over the past few years, and I could tell my grandpa was starting to cry over the phone. And he just told me, just pack up your stuff and come over here. We'll get you in this program, and we'll do what it needs to take. <laughs> and... Uh... I think that's a fascinating part. If, if, if there's some grandpas, if there's some grandmas who are here today, you have a powerful witness in the lives of those of your grandchildren and your families. And for five years, having a, a grandfather pray day in, day out for you, a phenomenal thing. So you showed up, you entered into the program. What has been going on in your life over the last 11 and a half months, and it's a process, right? It doesn't happen all at once, and you still have a ways to go. Just kind of bring everyone in on what's been going on. Well, it's easy to say the person that came in 11 months ago is not the person standing on this stage today. I went from a guy who complete, I hated community, I hated being around people. This whole group of guys behind me, they're the best people that ever come into my life. I care for these guys more than anything. Uh, the relationships that I've built through this program, God has done a complete 180 change on my heart. Um, I'm so indebted to him for the things that he's done for me. I truly realized how much God values and loves and cares about me and has plans for me and has a future for me. And um, I can't wait to see what he does in and through me for the rest of my life. I'm just glad to have this beautiful gift of life. You know, wrap it up here, Jake. What are you thankful to God for today, for Jesus? I'm thankful just being patient for, you know, my sinful nature, just forgiving me on a daily basis. His mercies are brand new every morning, and I couldn't be more grateful for that. I'm grateful for community. I'm grateful to have my family back in my life. I'm grateful just for the plans that he has for me and the things that I get to do now and uh, the life that I get to live, my health, my friends, my family, um, I just couldn't be more grateful to wake up with fresh air in my lungs every day. Praise God. Thanks, Jake. Appreciate you. And we're going to miss him. He's graduating our program in uh, just about two weeks, and the Lord has done a mighty work in his life. And so and now we're going to pass this mic on over to another graduate of the program. His name is Brandon. He was a former intern and a staff member with our program, and he's got his story that he'd like to share with you guys today. Uh, how you guys doing? Uh, my name is Brandon Young. Um, I came into the program when I was 19. Uh, I'm 22 now, so I graduated about a year and a half ago, something like that. Um, just wanted to share my testimony with you guys uh, through some spoken word, if that's okay. My story started in Detroit, then we moved out to the Burbs. Revival Tabernacle till I'm seven, that's my church. Pastor Tim Delina, that's the man that got the word. 
How could I have known I wear my pain just like a shirt? When I turned 15, CPS was in the mix. I told my sister we need them bills paid, case get dismissed. Why you think I told myself I gotta get us rich? Why there's all these problems that the money can't fix? It was really 15, that's when the devil had my life. Remember laying on my bed, contemplating suicide. But I couldn't tell the truth to my mama, so I lied. But I think she knew it too, cause you could see it in my eyes. Man, I'm so tired, and I don't wanna live this life. So I pull up on this girl, she's staying on the other side. The sun fell down, and then we smoking, getting high. I said, this won't be every day, but that was just another lie. So that's really when it changed, because I couldn't seem to stop. Things I said I'd never do, I started to do without a thought. Paranoid, running from police and changing spots. Hold up, isn't he a Christian? I guess not. They told me if you flip this sack, then you could really make a stack. When I turned 17, my brother taught me how to trap. I should have told him no, but it happened so fast. Man, I wish I stayed focused meditating on this rap. Student council president, fifth grade. 19 years, they do a drug raid. The orange is on the counter right in they face. I don't know how they ain't see it, guess I got grace. But the problem with it was, thing that happened right before I had my, pointed at them when they came in through the door. I ain't hear them say police, but I'm thanking the Lord. I'm so blessed that they ain't shooting, spill my body on the floor. Man, it's shame, drive addiction like a tour bus. I can't even feel it, medicate to get a rush. I got all these wounds that I've been trying to cover up. Man, I'm wishing I could stop them fixing trauma with a cup. But that's not the end, and I bet you probably knew that. It says, at the perfect time, Christ died for all of us. He could have came today and got the needle or a gun, but he wanted us to see a demonstration of his love, crucifixion on a tree where he hanging losing blood. See, Jesus changed my heart. Now he's what everything's about. My thoughts and my patterns, my actions in my mouth. I know that he loves me. I don't ever have to doubt. I started from the muck and mire. Jesus took me out. So I'm thankful that I struggled and he let me survive. My love is so much stronger with this thorn in my side. Everything isn't perfect, tell the truth, I won't lie. But I'm trusting in my God, so this is where I reside. And if this is my struggle compared to the alternative, man, you know I'm blessed, cause I ain't never even heard of this. Miracles occur, you give him everything to work with. The rich young ruler couldn't do it, miss his purpose. So that's my God and he protect me with his mighty arm. He got me covered way better than Jake from State Farm. This ain't no big bang, it's just a big God. And Mr. PT wrote it, boy, I did not. It's so many times I wasn't faithful, but he never stopped. I would not be shaken, built my house upon the rock. So my heart catch on fire when I think of what he's done. And I'm thinking way back just to see how far I come. Not through my own strength, but through the risen one. That's my father call him Abba, and he call me his son. Wow. Brandon Young. Thank you, Brandon. I'm Dave Bonello. I, am the, uh, I have the pleasure of serving as the uh, uh, choir director for Life Challenge and uh, been uh, connected with Life Challenge for many, many years, but doing this serving in this capacity um, for about six years now. Um, I have a strong connection and uh, I get uh, emotion to this church, and I'll explain to you uh, why real quickly. In 1981, a long time ago, 42 years ago, I was a broken young college student, 20 years old, on a hot Wednesday night, sitting in Ward Presbyterian Church in Livonia, and under the direction of Bible study with Dr. Hess, Dr. Bartlett Hess, um, I accepted the Lord. He gave an invitation for somebody who is hungry to um, accept Jesus into their heart. So when I walk into Hess Hall, there's a strong connection because he's a fine man. And for those of you that knew him, you can agree and attest to the glory of God. He delivered the word. Amen. Um, we're going to sing about that Jesus too. So join with us and make an enthusiastic, joyful noise to the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. You guys can have a seat. Thank you again, the choir. That was amazing. Um, my name is Ryan Clickus. I actually am one of the leaders up in our Flint campus primarily, and uh, I actually wanted to share a little bit about my story today and this morning and shed a little bit of light and what God has pulled me out of. I've been with Life Challenge a little over three years now, um, been serving in capacity north of two years, but I was at a place in my life where I was very broken um, and I needed help and I was in desperate need of it. But to rewind to the beginning, um, to kind of give you some highlights, if you will, at five years old, my parents divorced, and dad kind of moved 700 miles away. 
So I was raised by my mother with four brothers and sisters, and them being a little bit older than I was, I started dazzling with things at a very young age. Um, by 10 years old, I had had my first drink, I'd had my first um, marijuana joint, if you will. I was sexually abused. I was exposed to all these things. And before I knew it, they became socially acceptable to me at a very young age. In a way that I didn't really warrant or understand, but it became very codependent, if you will, in the relationship that I instilled with drugs as, as getting through life. At 16, tragedy struck home for me at the first time. My sister, Sydney, she was 23. She got in a car accident and was killed on site. And for me, that was a very hard time to get through. And in, in doing so, I ended up using drugs to help just numb the pain in that season of life. Fast forward um, three years, and I'm now a freshman in college. And my mother has been battling the last year with uh, stage four brain cancer. And it was my freshman year that she passed away as well. And mind you, with my parents being divorced, dad was never really in the picture. My mom was my, my mom, my, my father figure, my best friend, my role model. When I lost her, it got really dark. The only thing that kept me going was on her deathbed, she made me promise her that I would get my degree from school. And that's what I did. Kept me going. Fast forward another three years, now I'm a senior at Purdue, and I get a call one morning from a deputy in Dallas, Texas, where my brother had moved a few months back. And he asked me, you know, is this Ryan Clickus? I say, yes, sir. And he says, I regret to inform you, but your brother was shot and murdered in a road rage incident on his way to work this morning. He was 27. So three deaths in a matter of, you know, six years, all completely different. And at that time, being 16, 19, and 22, it was a lot to deal with. It was a lot. And there were different emotions in the midst of it, too. The man who murdered my brother was never caught. He never got found. So I actually moved out to Dallas, Texas for two years. And as Brandon kind of said, and you've seen from other people sharing, the man you see before you today, I don't recognize the man that I was in that season of life. I wanted blood for blood. In doing so in Dallas, I was down there. I had two guns in my car. I had an ounce of cocaine to keep me going, and I had a bottle of Jack Daniels or Jim Beam. And I would hunt this man six nights a week when I got off of work. Um, I was very vengeful. I was filled. I was just angry and hated everything that I knew. And the relationship that I had with God, being raised Catholic, I turned my back completely on him. I, I was kind of like Brandon had said. I just I couldn't fathom that he put me through all this. So with that being said, after this cycle for two years, you know, of, of hunting after this man, one day I hear this voice screaming at me to what I understand is the Holy Spirit now telling me that I need to run. And after three days of hearing that voice, I finally packed my bags. I went back home to Valparaiso, Indiana, um, which is kind of the stomping grounds of where I was born and raised. And prior to coming into Life Challenge, I, I tried a few different programs, short-term facilities, you know, 14, 30-day ones. The unfortunate part of those programs, as good as they might be for short-term effects, it's long-term results, and none of them have a spiritual component. The majority of them don't, not all. But I was missing that component in my life, and after this cycle, I was at a point where trying it on my own for six months with short-term help, I was on 17 psychiatric medications, and I was lost. I was walking around like a zombie. I had no hope. Suicidal ideation had never become so real in my life, but I was grateful that I had a gentleman his name is Mike, who was in my corner, and he got a hold of Life Challenge, and he brought me into the program. Um, <laughs> it's a challenge for a reason. It's in our name. It is not an easy program by any means. And the first three months, I fought it tooth and nail. I still didn't know who this guy was. I was still too mad to talk to him and to uh, just embrace the idea of what hope even looked like. And then I'll never forget it. We were in a chapel service one day up on our Flint campus, and at the time, we had 27 guys in the program, and I... To paint a picture, I didn't cry at my mom, brother, and sister's funeral. Like, I did not show emotion like that. I was a manly man, if you will. And we were playing worship music, and, and God just broke me in that moment. I got on my hands and knees, and I kid you not, for 45 minutes, I was crying hysterically, and all these emotions that had just built up. And it was literally in that chapel service that I gave my life to God, and I asked for his mercy and his forgiveness. And ever since, I've had a heart and a desire just to, to be on fire for him and get to know about him. And in doing so, he's blessed me in countless ways. Um, first and foremost, I want to be forgiven for my sin. I am not perfect by any means. I have wronged many people countless times. And by our nature of our human nature, our flesh is weak, and I will continue to, to sin in my life, if you will. So in doing that, I, I was able to forgive the man that murdered my brother. I don't know who he is. Um, 
I pray for his salvation in and of itself, though. I don't carry that weight on me anymore. The second one, um, I haven't been on any psychiatric medications in over three years now. The man you're seeing before you, nothing. That was Jesus in and of itself. It's beautiful. Um, the third thing, he reconciled me with my brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews, um, other family that's still living and around, and we have great relationships now. And then the biggest thing, too, is just the, the capacity to serve in his kingdom that he's called me into, to be able to disciple to the gentleman, to, to, to be a light, if you will, and let God's light shine through me and reflect of, this is possible, I've been where you're at. There is hope on the other side, and it's just a beautiful thing. Um, and I'm just grateful for the God we serve. And there's my favorite verse, it's Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, and just to paraphrase it, it's making that conscious decision, are you going to build your life on the rock or are you going to build it on the sand? And we're all guilty at one point in our life, whether it's drugs, gambling, pornography, um, you know, a sports addiction, womanizing, whatever it might be, you know, if you're going to continue to build your life on those things and not Christ, you're only going to have temporary happiness. But at Life Challenge, we really drive home the message of building your rock on Jesus, on his cornerstone, and that's where the, the internal joy comes from. And no matter what you're going through in life, living and having that, it refines you. And it gives you hope and, and just, just pure joy. It genuinely does. And I'm grateful for that. Um, so that's my story. I'm grateful for the God we serve. Real quick, I do just want to share before Pastor Jeff comes back up. There's three ways you can partner with us. Um, we are a 501c3. And financially, you guys, financial support. We have a table outside. Um, the guys made some signs. We have some T-shirts available for sale. And we also have a great program. It's called Sponsor a Life. I like to call it Save a Life. But for $35 a month, you guys would actually sponsor one of our students. We'll send you a testimony card, and you can become pen pals with them. Um, just encourage them, shed light in their life, give them hope, um, and it's a really neat opportunity. Um, secondly, please be ambassadors for us, as Pastor Luke had referenced too. We need your guys' help. A lot of people raised their hands when you said you knew a family member or a colleague or somebody in your community that struggles with addiction. Let them know we exist. And at the very least, intercede on their behalf and get them a hold of us. We have plenty of business cards out there. Please come and grab some or come and speak with myself or a resident and hear their story as well. And then lastly, the power of prayer. Please come alongside us in prayer. Pray for the gentlemen. Come, I encourage all of you to meet one of the gentlemen and ask how you can be praying for them. Um, but secondly, as a ministry, pray for, pray for a, a filling of the program, if you will. Um, there's right now is a disconnect in us reaching people that need help. And I don't know what that is. But we need your guys' help in praying for that to help fill the beds. We know there's a need for people that need help. Let us do what God's called us to do in being the hands and feet and, and just continue to pray and lift us up for that. So I thank you guys so much, and I'm going to pass it over to Pastor Jeff. Good job. People matter, and God changes lives. People matter. You believe that, you understand that, and you also believe and understand that God does change lives. He really does. I want to conclude by directing your attention to a familiar passage. It's just a verse. It's taken from Matthew chapter 18, words of Jesus. I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Lord, in these final moments of our gathering, now may your word spread rapidly. In Jesus' name, amen. Except you become like a child. What, gullible? Silly? Stupid? Jesus tells us in the next verse, unless you humble yourself. Unless you humble yourself, you'll never make the kingdom. I remember uh, years ago being at a minister's conference. It happened to be um, with Desiring God, John Piper, and um, it was probably 25 years ago, and I was around a table during a lunch hour with uh, probably five other different faces along with two members of my own. And I looked at a person who looks like me with gray hair. And I said, you know, 
what have you learned over the years? What have you picked up? You know, I'm new in ministry. And what have you learned? And I'll never forget what he said. It was so anticlimactic. It was so disappointing to hear initially. Jeff, I can't do anything without Jesus. I was looking for some, you know, maxim, for some, you know, John Maxwell, you know, pithy statement. How true that is. I can't do anything without Jesus. I think life is one long lesson in humility. God orchestrating challenges, trials into our lives. Not to harm us, but to heal us. To humble us. Except you become like children. You know, there's something about children. I've raised four, and now I have two precious granddaughters. I tell you, I thought guys were cool. Four sons, man, there's nothing like little girls. And those little girls have eclipsed the boys. I love you, Luke, and your brothers, but man, your little daughter and your brother's little daughter, man. Adeline, our oldest of the two, she's just over two. She has no qualms about asking Papa for anything. Papa, play. Papa, ice cream. Papa. As soon as she says Papa, it's like, you want the moon? I'll give you that too, kid. She's presumptuous. She presumes that Papa is good and able. She's childlike. She's humble. She knows whether or not it's conscious. Of course not. But she knows she can't make things happen, but Papa can. And so she has no qualms about asking. Less than two weeks ago, my dad and I were talking. little context. My dad was my... Uh, um, he preceded me. And I had the joy of intersecting with him in ministry for five and a half years. My dad is now 82. And so I try to call him once a week. And we were talking, and um, he's an optimistic chap, but, you know, he's aging, and he's got health challenges, and he, you know, bears his soul to me. And he said, Jeff, again, he's 82. Jeff, you know, I'm just believing God for a miracle in my body. And he just went on, and I'm just listening. And I hate to admit this, but in the back of my head, I'm thinking, Dad, you're not dealing with reality. You're old. Bodies break down. People die. And he just went on. And after I hung up, I found the Holy Spirit checking me, convicting me. Jeff, you've gotten too adult-like. You've grown up. You're too smart for your own good. Do I smell a little arrogance there, a little pride? I'm Abba Father. Who knows? Maybe I will heal your dad. Who knows? And I thought to myself later, Jim, like I want to grow older like you. I want to grow older like my dad in that way. I want to be the guy if I make 90, if I make 100. I'm still trusting God. Trusting him for a healing here. Trusting him for my, my grandson's salvation. Trusting him to intervene in this Christ. I just believe God and am standing on his word. No matter if I look foolish or stupid or silly. I want to become more childlike as I journey. Because that childlikeness, that humility, is that which honors Jesus Christ. So my challenge to you, to me in particular, is not to grow up, it's to grow down. To grow down. Lord, truly we cannot do anything without you. Thank you, God, for 
providing a, a mechanism, Lord, in this church and at Life Challenge for helping people heal, steps, programs, but we realize, Lord, that unless you do something in and through those, it's all for naught. Help us. Help us, God, to become more and more like children who presume, who presume in a good way, who just assume you know how to fix things and you want to fix things and you can fix things. Help us to walk humbly in Jesus' name. And all God's people would join me in saying amen and amen.